All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. We may have a few more people join us in the room, which is great. And thanks to everyone in our online audience as well today. Uh, Dana, are we okay? Great. All right. Um, welcome to the first ESI Congressional Briefing of 2024. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. We are going to be unpacking the fifth National Climate Assessment. I'd like to start by sharing thanks with Representative Paul Tonko's office and the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition for their help with the room today. Thank you, Sharon and David and everyone for all your help with that. I'm Dan Bursett. I'm the president of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And not just is this the first briefing of 2024, this is the first briefing of the year we are celebrating 40 years of congressional education. Uh, that's right. If you believe it, uh, 40 years ago, a bipartisan group of members of Congress decided that what this country needed, what policymakers needed, was an organization, independent, nonpartisan, science-based, to pull together informational resources to help inform policymakers and their staff about climate change topics. Originally, environmental and energy topics, and over time, climate change topics. Um, and we've been doing it every day since then, and it's a great joy to be back up here on the Hill doing these sorts of briefings. We do a lot of briefings. Uh, last year we did a couple dozen. This year we're probably going to be uh, do a couple dozen. We'll be back two weeks from today on February 1st to talk about energy earth shots, uh, which is something you may be hearing coming out of the Department of Energy. We'll be back a couple weeks after that to talk about innovations in weather forecasting. Uh, we'll be doing a briefing on the budget and appropriations process. You won't want to miss that. And there's even more to come. Uh, our briefings are always free. They're always online, uh, even if you can't be with us in person. There's always an opportunity to check them out. You can also uh, re uh, download all of the presentation materials from our speakers. You can watch archived webcasts. And after a couple weeks, you can even read summary notes uh, of what the panelists said. We want these briefings to be uh, very, very useful resources. You might say, well, that's an awful lot to keep up with. How could I possibly do so? Well, just so happens that every other Tuesday, we issue Climate Change Solutions, which is our biweekly newsletter. If you haven't already subscribed to that, I really encourage you to. It's a great way to keep up with all of our resources, not just briefings. We also do articles, podcasts, fact sheets, issue briefs. Our goal when we do these resources is we understand what it's like to have a boss come to you on like, I don't know, like a 3 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon and say, hey, what's this thing? And if it's a climate change thing, you can count on EESI to help you find an answer to that question. We try to make our resources timely, relevant, accessible, and practical. And a lot of thought goes into that. For example, at some point, we're going to have a farm bill. And when we do have a farm bill, or when we're debating farm bill text, you can come to EESI.org, and you can download side by side by side comparison charts of what the House is proposing, what the Senate's proposing, and eventually uh, what the conferees are talking about uh, as we move through that process. Um, it's much, much better to have the information before you need it. And we try really hard to give you the information before you all even know you need it. Um, so that you can help your bosses stay informed uh, and up to date on climate change topics. But today we're here to talk about the fifth National Climate Assessment, which is a really big deal because in many ways it's for Congress and it's really important for policymakers to take an opportunity to learn more about what the fifth National Climate Assessment had to say. It was released uh, last year uh, on November 14th, so a little bit more than two months ago. And this re uh, report absolutely demands the attention of Congress. NCA5, as it's abbreviated, is the most comprehensive, holistic, and inclusive report to date on national climate risk and response. If you read the report, you'll note that there are some signs of progress, but unfortunately nowhere near the scale, scope, or pace necessary to achieve the US goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% by 2030. And the report also makes it crystal clear, and we'll hear more about this today, that our resolve to adapt to climate impacts and help communities improve their resilience is plainly insufficient. Our next slide up on the screen here is a survey. Um, we usually, we talk about our survey at the end, but maybe you're only able to join us for the first half. And so if you like what you're hearing, if you don't like what you're hearing, uh, if you have comments, feedback, if you on the live cast, if you have any audio or video, uh, video problems, you can use this link to tell us what you think. We read every response. And if you're in the room, you can use that QR code to take you to the survey as well. But now, uh, we are going to hear from a very special guest. Representative Scott Peters uh, is joining us today via pre-recorded video remarks. 
Representative Peters was elected in 2012 and today serves California's 50th congressional district. He is a member of the House Energy and Commerce and House Budget Committees, where he's championed and passed historic legislation to protect our environment and promote the energy transition. Uh, Representative Peters also works to fix a broken budget process and take our nation's unsustainable debt and tackle our un nation's unsustainable debt. And in addition to his committee assignments, he co-chairs the Bipartisan Fiscal Forum, the House Special Operations Forces Caucus. He chairs the New Democrat Coalition's Climate Change and Clean Energy Task Force and is the vice chair of the LGBTQ Equality Caucus. And so any further ado, my colleague is going to show us Representative Peters' video. Hi, everyone. I'm Congressman Scott Peters, and it's great to be with you virtually today to talk about the fifth National Climate Assessment, a critically important, congressionally mandated interagency effort that's been informing policymakers for over 20 years. First, I want to thank the U.S. Global Change Research Program for its work on the report, as well as EESI for shedding light on the key takeaways. I hope these findings will be a critical tool in helping policymakers first understand the causes and impacts of climate change, and two, to encourage us to build enduring natural, national resilience against climate hazards that threaten human health and well-being, critical infrastructure, and natural environments. The science is very clear. To avoid the worst consequences of climate change, the entire world, not just the U.S., needs to commit to bold action to get emissions under control. But the U.S. will only remain a global leader by embracing this challenge and raising our ambition to meet this historic moment, not by abdicating responsibility and pointing fingers elsewhere. We can address climate change, create millions of good paying jobs, and reduce economic inequality by raising our standards and accepting our responsibility to lead. As we work aggressively to combat the climate crisis, we also have to prepare our communities for the unavoidable destruction of climate change. In my district in San Diego, this means rising sea levels and coastal erosion, more frequent and intense wildfires, drought, heat waves, and extreme weather that endangers the health, safety, and livelihoods of my constituents. I've worked with my colleague Rep. Maria Salazar and my Senate colleagues on NCARS, the National Coordination on Adaptation and Resilience for Security Act, which mandates the development of a national strategy to streamline this work and the creation of a permanent position at the White House to coordinate our climate resiliency efforts. I appreciate the thoughtful work you all do on this topic, and I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues and all of you on solutions to this great, great challenge. Thank you again for having me, and please enjoy the briefing. And thank you to Representative Peters and his great staff uh, for helping uh, uh, enable his participation in the event today. They are a really great group to work with, and we really, really appreciate his leadership. Um, we're going to go ahead and get underway with our panelists. And this is a pretty good panel. Uh, but I have one more thing I need to say, and that is uh, this panel is so good, um, we will absolutely have time for questions and answers. Uh, and you will definitely have questions, uh, and they will probably have answers. Uh, for folks in the room, um, my colleague Allison will have a microphone, and she'll be very, very happy to find you in the audience, and you can ask your question in person. If you're in our online audience, you have a couple different options. The first is you can send us an email with your question, and that email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K, at EESI.org. You can also tweet us uh, at EESI online, e -E online. And speaking of EESI online, uh, be sure to follow us on social media. In addition to X, the website formerly known as Twitter, and Facebook and LinkedIn, we're also doing real-time coverage of our briefing today on our Instagram story. But without any further ado, that brings us to the first of our panelists today. Rosina Bierbaum is the Roy F. Weston Chair of Natural Economics at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy and a professor at the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability. She served for two decades in the U.S. legislative and executive branches and has also served on President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology and as an adaptation fellow at the World Bank, uh, co-authoring the World Development Report on Climate Change. Rosina chairs the Scientific and Technical Advisory Panel of the Global Environment Facility. She's also a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And perhaps most prestigious of all, Rosina is a member of ESI's Board of Directors. So Rosina, it is always a thrill to welcome you to one of our briefings today. Uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dan. I'm very, very proud to be a member of the Board of EESI, which kept me well informed during those 20 years in the legislative and executive branches. Um, I thought I would use my 10 minutes and not PowerPoint 
to make five points. And, and one, talk about the evolution of the assessment. Second, to talk about the review process. Third, about its usefulness. Fourth, about some new information. And then fifth, as we think about the future, what might we hope for in the sixth one? So yes, I was working for the Congress when the Global Change Act of 1990 was passed. And the text of that is still quite formidable. It requires a report to the Congress and to the President that integrates, evaluates, and interprets the findings of the multi-agency program, the US Global Change Research Program, discusses scientific uncertainties, analyzes the effects of global change on the natural environment, on agriculture, on energy, land, water, transportation, human health and welfare, social systems, and biological diversity. <laughs> um, and that's not enough. You will also project out 20 to 100 years. So Congress, you asked for a lot. But this is, as Dan said, your report. And I think really the idea was you know, to hold the administration's feet to the fire to show what the then $1 billion program was producing and how it was giving information that was usable. So um, I then, within minutes of that act being passed, ended up going to the White House Science Office and was told, do the first national climate assessment. So there is a lesson here, which is be careful what you ask for, you may have to do it. Um, but now we have the fifth one. And fortunately, the US Global Change Program has grown to $4 billion or more. It includes a coordination across 15 of the federal agencies. And the assessment's been produced for both Republican and Democratic administrations. And unlike many of the inscrutable things scientists like me tend to write, this one has um, great graphics. It's very accessible, it's clickable, it's searchable. Um, and you can find chapters written by sector of the economy, such as agriculture or energy or water, or you can find it by um, response actions, mitigation or reducing emissions, or adaptation or coping with climate change, and by region of the United States. And, and as you know, none of us lives in, in the average global climate. And how climate feels to you in your place in the Midwest is very different than it'll feel in the Southeast US, which Dr. Rivers will discuss. And then the regional chapters pull together what is at risk in those regions based on a suite of pre-existing conditions, the kind of crops that are grown there, the availability of clean water, the industry of that region, the infrastructure of that region, and the economy, and how all of that might change in the future. We know climate change affects all sectors at the same time, um, but the composite impact of climate change, whether from the slow onset or the changing extreme events, will play out differently, differently in Maryland or in Florida or in Alaska. And that then requires us to plan for, manage, and have policies that are different in those different places. So I think one lesson is that climate change overlays on top of existing stresses, um, such as ongoing biodiversity loss or spreading invasive species like the emerald ash borer or water shortages that we already have in the Southwest. Um, so yes, it's true. I helped design the first national climate assessment, and I wrote the adaptation chapter for the third one, but I had no role in this, so I think I am completely unbiased in my remarks. Um, and I thought one thing that I should mention, you know, peer review has been much in the press of late, um, but I'd like to say that this report has gone through several rounds of reviews, first by government scientists, then by expert scientists, then the lay public. And additionally, there were something like 34 public uh, engagement sessions, three tribal sessions, and participation in both youth and environmental justice dialogues. And then <laughs> the National Academy of Sciences reviewed it and produced a 346-page report. And then it was re-reviewed and revised based on all of the above. And each chapter actually has a wonderful traceable account if you want to look and find the original data. So this is quite amazingly reviewed. Um, who should be using this? Well, as you look through it, you'll see 
There's information that can help hospital managers think about how at risk they are from storm surge. And so, for example, lots of thought going into relocating equipment from the basement so that you can continue to operate when there's floods. Many of you know that historically, water managers have planned for the old 100-year extreme event, um, but past is no longer prologue. There were three 500-year floods in Houston in three years. And this assessment is helping explain the new normal and the new 500-year event. And so, for example, Chicago, which has experienced the worst precipitation in 30 years, is thinking about how can it now prevent the city from flooding. And we're seeing farmers who are experiencing earlier springs and later fall and more droughts and more floods uh, thinking about cropping dates and which crops can persist and, and be most productive. And for example, now Michigan is growing many more cherry cultivars than it used to because we're getting earlier and later frost dates. And so we need to adapt to remarkable, changeable um, conditions. Certainly also health officers can evaluate the likely frequency and duration of heat events, which we've seen all around the world, and the increased movement of disease vectors like ticks and mold and pathogens. And so really, this assessment is meant for managers, for planners, for farmers. Um, it's, it's useful no matter what walk of life you're in. I must say, I um, assigned the regional chapters to my graduate student class. And um, I thought it would be important to also get the youth review, which, which Allison can talk about her own youth review. Um, but the students, I have to say, love the graphics. They love the interactive nature. They love the clarification of the levels of uncertainty. They love the atlas, where you can look at the climate maps and the climate data. But they were also really moved by the youth art and by the poem by our poet laureate. And you know, <laughs> climate change is very real to youth and pervades their thoughts of their future quality of life. This fifth assessment has a much stronger look at distributional impacts um, with a new chapter on economics and also a new chapter on social um, systems, social science and social systems and justice. Um, and looks at who's going to bear the impacts more clearly. And it's often really the poorest in any part of the country. And the communities that will be affected or are already affected are better called out in this report as are issues related to tribes. You know, we've learned now that vulnerability to climate change is often reflective of the past, too. So for example, historic redlining in cities like Richmond, where it's impossible to have enough green space or parks. The ability to protect people and infrastructure depends on characterizing what's vulnerable and then how that can be ameliorated. And, and I guess I would say, as you've already intimated, Dan, that thinking about climate adaptation and resilience has been under-attended to in general, really for most of the last 20 years. And so researchers, planners, and managers are all scrambling to catch up with the changes we're already seeing and more to be in place. Um, Caitlin will tell us more about the adaptation chapter. And indeed, while hundreds of cities and dozens of states have adaptation plans on the books, very few have gotten to the point of implementation of the measures they've identified as helpful. And even fewer have gotten to the point of evaluating what measures have been implemented to determine what more can be done and what best practices are. So I congratulate the, the progress this report has made on many of these issues. And also, um, Senator Coons, Murkowski, and Representatives Peter and Salazar for their focus on a national um, coordination on adaptation and resilience for Security Act. And you know, indeed, in several briefings that EESI has held before, um, we've heard that not just human security, but national security issues are, are, are at risk and readiness, as was reported by several of the armed services. So whether you look at our domestic ports flooding, extreme events affecting infrastructure or migration, et cetera, 
So the frequency and intensity of extreme events, as I've said, requires new thinking. We're going to have more intense fires, floods, droughts, heat waves. And as the report notes, in 2023, the U.S. experienced $28 billion impacts. The, some of those are not yet added up because we haven't done the East Coast floods, which went from Maine down to Florida, but it'll be well over $100 billion. And my last point is, as, he, as the climate, as NCA5 shows, adaptation actions are increasing, but they're still well behind. Mitigation or emissions reduction, and Adrian will talk about the mitigation chapter. We know, as Dan said, the current emission reductions aren't enough either, but energy research does have a few decades on adaptation research. And so an area that could help with both mitigation and adaptation and deserving more attention, I would argue, is nature-based solutions or also called natural climate solutions. Storing carbon in forests and soils and mangroves, protecting wildlife and habitat and restoring habitat. And those can help buffer sea level rise, absorb floodwaters, green spaces can cool cities. And so um, a new survey, which I think was just summarized by EESI on Tuesday, said that 92% of US citizens support those kind of nature-based solutions actions across the political spectrum. So those are some win-wins that I think we need to focus on more going forward. So by, by NCA 6, I hope we have ramped up mitigation and adaptation, learned from ongoing mitigation and adaptation, have pursued nature-based solutions, have increased our resilience to natural disaster, and I hope we'll be showing dramatic progress on all of these, not incremental, but truly transformational as we need to. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rosina. I'll return that to, your, to its owner. Um, thank you very much. Um, that was great. You mentioned the artwork, and Allison and Izzy brought uh, the artwork. So it's actually out on the front table. If you want to check it out, it's really, really cool. Um, and it is graphically, it's aesthetically pleasing to look at. Uh, it's a really impressive report. I don't know if the Google Doc that you used to do all of the peer review was nearly as aesthetically pleasing as the artwork <laughs> it, or, or whatever editing software you used. Um, Rosina, you mentioned nature-based solutions, natural climate solutions. We just did an article about the US Nature for Climate survey that came out, I think, on Tuesday. It was in our newsletter. We also did a side event at COP28 on uh, carbon management, uh, carbon markets. Uh, and that's something that's available, uh, like every one of our past events, um, on our website if you'd like to learn more a little bit about that. So our next panelist is perhaps the panelist that helped make it all possible. Allison Crimmins is a climate scientist and the director of the Fish National Climate Assessment. Uh, Allison is detailed to the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy from the EPA's Office of Air and Radiation. Her expertise lies in assessing domestic and international climate impacts and mitigation benefits, particularly from health and economic perspectives. Allison has a record of convening diverse teams devoted to scientifically sound risk assessment and policy implementation, notably as the lead of the 2016 US Climate and Health Assessment. Allison, Welcome to the briefing, and congratulations again on a really, really impressive product. Thank you so much. All right, let me see. All right, thank you for having me. Um, as Dan noted, the Fifth National Climate Assessment, or NCA5, uh, I'm going to use that acronym a lot, uh, is the most up-to-date and comprehensive report on how climate change is affecting us right here in the United States. Um, it was released on November 14th uh, of last year, so I'm very excited to be here to actually share some of the findings with you. I didn't want to spend too much time giving you sort of the, the 101 about the National Climate Assessment, since I knew Rosina was going to just set me up perfectly for that. Um, so I, I won't go over all of these uh, points here, but I did want to call out just a couple of them um, that I think might be particularly of interest here. Uh, and the first is that while uh, the national climate assessments are policy relevant, they are not policy pres prescriptive. Uh, so we do not include any recommendations. Uh, we don't tell you what you should do. We avoid the word should. Uh, we don't advocate for anything. Instead, what we're doing is providing you with the information you need to make decisions. And that is what the National Climate Assessment is in a nutshell. It is the public's guide, it is your guide uh, to climate change in the United States. So when you're writing policy, when you're making decisions, 
about when or how to build something or where to move something or how to manage infrastructure, this is your go-to source uh, for climate data to inform those decisions. And I hope by the end of this, I will have convinced you that this is not just a giant dusty tome to sit on a shelf somewhere. This is actually a, a, a larger project that is designed to be useful and usable to the American public. So this is our uh, table of contents. You heard some of these topics mentioned when Rosina was talking about uh, the requirements of the Global Change Research Act of 1990. Uh, I hope you see this list and you think, oh, there's a little something for everyone here. Uh, we do have physical uh, climate chapters on trends, both observed and projected trends uh, of climate uh, factors like precipitation, temperature. Uh, we also have uh, a number of national topics uh, that look across the entire US for a specific sector or a group of people. Uh, we have 10 regional chapters. You'll hear from one of those today. Uh, and we have a chapter on adaptation and mitigation. It is a very, very large report. It is written by 500 authors and 250 technical contributors from every single state in the nation, as well as uh, Guam, Palau, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, and it is, because of its uh, very robust review process, a report that also takes a really long time to develop. So uh, I'm going to walk you through each of these five messages. I think five was the number that we were uh, you know, in our brain as we were coming up with our talking points here uh, for NCA5. Uh, I'm going to give you one slide for each of these five key messages. And the first big key message of the assessment is that we are seeing communities across the country taking climate actions, particularly at the state and city level to reduce emissions and build resiliency. And I want to point out that this is uh, a little bit different from previous assessments, uh, and, and thankfully so, that we didn't have to start the first key message with climate change is real. Uh, we are well, well past that point now, and I think it's uh, really demonstrative of how the conversation in the US has advanced since previous assessments, that the very first thing we're starting with is the climate actions. Uh, we have observed U.S. emissions falling since they peaked in 2007, all while GDP and population have continued to increase. And that observed fall in U.S. emissions since 2007 is primarily due to uh, the decrease in electricity generation from coal. However, we've also seen a lot of growth in renewable capacities. Uh, so the, that growth that you're seeing in this chart here has been supported by uh, very rapidly dropping costs of zero and low carbon energy technologies. So when the cost of wind energy has dropped 70%, the cost of solar energy has dropped 90% over just the last decade. And we do expect that recent legislation uh, will further increase deployment of that clean energy technology. At the same time, more and more people across the United States are experiencing climate change right now. And we, uh, many of us experience climate change through extreme weather events. In the 1980s, the country experienced, on average, $1 billion disaster every four months. And now there's one on average every three weeks. That was definitely a statistic that when I read it in the report, I had to step back. That is um, a, a really dire statistic. And as Rosina noted, just last year, we had $28 billion events. Uh, NCA's new chapter on economics finds that climate change impacts and damages will impose substantial new costs to the U.S. economy and limit economic opportunities for many Americans, as the cost of things like groceries, uh, health care, insurance, uh, repair, and building costs all increase. And we know that climate change also threatens critical infrastructure and public services, our ecosystems, and our culture, the things we love to do, our pastimes, and our traditions. The third uh, key message here is on equity and justice. And as uh, Rosina noted, we do have a new chapter on social systems and justice. But I want to note that uh, these themes, environmental justice, really run throughout the entire assessment. So it's not just in that one chapter. It is really uh, throughout every chapter of NCA5. The assessment notes that some overburdened and underrepresented communities are at higher risk of climate impacts due to the cumulative effects of social and economic inequities caused by ongoing systemic discrimination, exclusion, and underinvestment. 
I'm showing here on the slide uh, an image from our water chapter. The assessment found that neighborhoods that are home to racial minorities and low income families have the highest inland flood exposures in the South. And across the entire nation, black communities are expected to experience a disproportionate share of future flood damages. Our fourth takeaway is about what mitigation and adaptation actions are within reach right now and where we really need to be going in the future. And I hope you'll hear a, a bit more uh, on these topics from Caitlin and Adrian later. Uh, we know that we can get a long way towards our goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 uh, with widespread implementation of currently available and cost effective technologies. And I wanna emphasize that widespread implementation because we really need to be moving a lot faster and we need to go a lot further. To reach the net zero target, we would need to expand our annual growth in wind and solar capacity faster than we have ever done before. And we need to be researching and looking into additional options for both reducing our emissions and increasing uh, carbon uptake, for instance, through nature-based solutions. Limiting severe climate risks in the US uh, requires not just deeper cuts in global emissions, but also accelerated adaptation actions. And I think you'll hear from Caitlin, uh, I'm guessing that to date, many of our uh, adaptations have been really incremental in nature. Uh, we need to be thinking more about transformative adaptation actions to really keep a pace with climate change. So not just, uh, you know, treating the symptoms, but actually preparing our country for the, the climate risks that we're facing. The fifth and last takeaway I'll talk about here is about the benefits of mitigation and proactive adaptation investments. Uh, so we know that some of the climate benefits, even from uh, very aggressive emission reductions, may not be detectable until the middle of the century or later. However, there are many other immediate or near-term benefits uh, that come from taking mitigation and adaptation actions. Uh, things that are not just uh, helping our children or our grandchildren, that are helping us right now, uh, like immediate improvements in air quality and other benefits to human health. Uh, I, I'm showing an example here of a near-term benefit, which is the increase in clean energy jobs. Uh, these are expected to completely offset the number of fossil fuel related jobs. And uh, we know that as our country is shifting to low carbon energy industries, we need to be thinking about a just transition. Uh, we need to be thinking about how to train displaced fossil fuel workers and address existing racial and gender disparities in the energy workforces. So as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the National Climate Assessment is your guide to climate change in the US. And to that end, we developed uh, some new paths of entry into the report. Uh, as mentioned, we had our first ever call for art, which was really fantastic. We had 800 uh, submissions, and 92 of those pieces are included in the assessment. Uh, we have a poem written by the US Poet Laureate, Laureate Ada Lamone. Uh, we've developed some podcasts and, and recorded an audiobook of the executive summary. We're also translating the entire report into Spanish for the first time, which should be available, I'm guessing, probably April timeframe um, as, as we work through all of those. And we really have a lot of uh, downloadable and shareable figures. So I want to end uh, with one of those resources that I hope will be particularly useful to you. This is our NCA Atlas, uh, which is an online digital tool that allows you to choose the climate uh, variable of your interest, choose the uh, future scenario of your interest, and then really zoom into your county. So if the exact figure that you want is not in the report, you can use the exact same data that uh, was approved in the National Climate Assessment to develop that figure. And I will uh, end with this slide to show you some of our resources and where those can be found. Thank you. Allison, I'll return your placard. Yep. Um, who read the audio book of the first chapter? You read it? Yeah, who's like the I reader? Okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, okay. I haven't heard it, but I was wondering, like, maybe maybe for NCA6, <laughs> we, should, we could figure out who the celebrity yeah. celebrity author should be. Um, we, uh, you mentioned the, the jobs impact, and uh, we'll actually have a, um, thank you, Allison, uh, we'll actually have our jobs fact sheet coming out 
in, in the next little while. And we also track adaptation jobs um, as well, not just renewable energy and energy sector and energy efficiency as well. Um, uh, Allison had great slides. Our other panelists will I, as well. And those slides are available out on the front table if you'd like to get a copy if you haven't yet. They're also available online uh, if you'd like to download them. And if you'd like to go back to anything in Allison's presentation or anything uh, at the briefing today, uh, we will be posting um, an archived webcast, um, so you can go back and rewatch it. And like I said, we'll have some summary notes coming up. If you are in the audience, in person or online, and you're getting questions that are bubbling up, you'll have an opportunity to ask them. If you're in the room, we'll have a microphone go around. If you're in our online audience, you can send us an email. And the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K, at EESI.org. Our next panelist is Adrian Hollis. Adrian leads efforts to advance climate justice policy and programs at the National Wildlife uh, Federation. With almost 30 years of experience across nonprofit, government, and academic sectors, both as an environmental toxicologist and attorney, Adrian uh, focuses her work on the intersection of public health, environmental justice, and climate change, and on methods for assessing and documenting health impacts of climate change on communities of color and other traditionally disenfranchised groups uh, she also serves as co-director of the Environmental Protection Agency's Region 3 Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Center grant, and she is an author of the mitigation chapter of the 5th National Climate Assessment. And a little bird said, you just had a birthday. So happy birthday as well. Uh, welcome to the lectern. I'll turn it over to you. I always do, so uh, let's see. Next. Yeah. Good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation, um, EESI. I have to, now that I'm old, I have to use my glasses <laughs> as of two days ago. So um, <laughs> some of this information I'm just going to, uh, thanks to Allison, I only have to touch on briefly. I, don't, I won't beat you over the head with that. I'll beat you over the head with some other stuff. So um, the clicker is here. So. Because I'm also a professor, I have so I threw in some definitions, so bear with me. It doesn't mean I don't think that you know this. Um, so mitigation is emissions reduction or removing um, carbon from the atmosphere when the goal uh, is to avoid or reduce the effects of climate change. And it's also the most cost-effective response to climate change. Everybody might not agree, but it's in the assessment, so it must be true. So. <laughs> So, um, in sticking with our theme of five, I'm going to discuss the five key messages from the mitigation chapter. And the first one is successful mitigation means reaching net zero emissions. And by emissions, we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions. And people always ask, uh, what are greenhouse gases, right? And that includes carbon dioxide, which enters the atmosphere through burning fossil fuels or a number of other methodologies. And, in 2021, actually 79% of um, the emissions were from CO2. Also, methane is another one, as is nitrous oxide, and the fluorinated gases like hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, and others are also considered to be uh, important greenhouse gases. So when we talk about net zero, what does that mean? And this was a question that came up last year at um, COP27. Um, so net zero means that the amount of greenhouse gases that are being emitted into the atmosphere should equal the amount of greenhouse gases that are being removed from the atmosphere, right? Of course, everybody wants absolute zero where nothing is being emitted, but in the meantime and in between time, um, net zero is the way to go. Um, there's also hard net zero, which means that um, the um, activities of removal is sustained permanently or for a longer period of time. So this is just an example of the, um, from, from the chapter that shows you how we have to, it, it shows greenhouse gas emissions, first of all, from different sectors. I'm not going to go into that in detail. But what I wanted you to see is that by 2030, we have to reduce our levels by 52, 50 to 52%. 2030, this is 2024. We only have six years to do this. Well, you know, to continue doing this or to increase what we're doing, right? And that's important. And I think when you put it in, in terms that people understand, it's a little scary. So I like things that are scary. So our key message, our second key message is that we already know how to drastically reduce, 
reduce emissions. And that's the good news, right? Um, Allison talked a lot about that, and I think that it's important what, you know, some of the methodology that you talked about is important, that we know that, you know, increasing nature-based solutions, um, energy efficiency improvements are ways that we need to um, focus on reducing emissions as well as widespread electrification of the transportation sector is another way. We still may need low carbon fuels for things, you know, think airplanes and other, um, a few other, um, I guess, applications, industry. Land related emissions in the U.S. can be reduced, um, which increases the, like, by increasing the efficiency of food systems, for example, which is important. And of course, there's always the um, ever growing problem of um, agricultural practices and the protection of um, and restoring natural lands is a big issue. And I think that there are a lot of groups that are working on that, including our work um, with um, a nature-based center that we're standing up at the National Wildlife Federation. I threw that in as a commercial. So um, the third key message is that to reach net zero emissions, we need to do more. There need to be um, additional actions. And the problem is that there are a lot of uncertainties that exist with some of the processes that have been identified, not, not the ones that we're already using that are, have been cost effective, new ones, or ones that are just coming up or that are currently under research, undergoing research. Um, there are differences in the scale and mix of energy sources, as well as carbon management. And in my work, one of the issues, of course, is around carbon management, specifically carbon capture and sequestration with communities, there are a lot of concerns, and I think that this ch chapter, this, this assessment, does a lot um, in the way of hearing and reporting those community concerns. The fourth um, key message, which I think is very, also very important, is the fact that mitigation can be sustainable, healthy, and fair. Why is that important? Uh-oh. That's important. That, uh, let me go back. All right, here we are. So, I get two, two minutes back. Um, <laughs> when we talk about mitigation being sustainable, healthy, and fair, um, Allison talked about people who are hit worse and first and worse, right? And those are our communities that, because of historic racist practices and like redlining and other things, they're not in a position to, prote to be protected from climate change. They live in low lying areas, they live in areas that, where flooding is, is more likely to occur, they don't have access to uh, heat. Um, at the same level, you know, because maybe the infrastructure uh, is at risk. And there's just so many other factors that, you know, we need to address. And I think that this, this key message really gets at that, really gets to the heart of that. Um, and the, um, some rarely represented but important issues in mitigation scenarios include air pollution, which we've heard about and we know about um, who's most at risk. And we, we also have seen the relationship between air pollution and things like COVID, in that with particulate matter, there's this whole thought about particulate matter um, sort of hitching a ride on COVID particles and then in being embedded in deep in the lung. Siting and land use, and not just siting of like wind and solar, but also siting of, um, and this uh, siting of, this is the concern that I've heard from communities, siting of facilities when you're testing certain strategies in the communities, water use, Solar and, and, and wind is not as um, water intensive uh, as some other uh, mechanisms, labor, supply chain, and of course, um, energy equity and environmental justice, which I touched on a minute ago. And this is just a diagram, quick, just showing you that in, the, in A, this is the red line maps from the 1930s, and B shows you the pollution in 2010. And if you look, um, it's the same areas that have the highest pollution. Right? And this is just one of many diagrams that you know, really drive home the issue. And then the fifth message is that governments, organizations, and industry can act to reduce uh, emissions. The good thing about that is that a lot of them are already doing it. And, you know, there are a wide range of actors that have been involved in efforts to accelerate clean energy transition and mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, right? Including new legislation, we've seen that, new rules, regulations and executive orders and voluntary actions that both individuals and organizations and other groups are engaged in. 
Um, the, I don't want to lose my, I have an, my important message here. The, the next slide shows you how, what some of the uh, people are doing. 25 states, 675 cities, 300 universities, and hundreds of companies have announced net zero emission targets. I think that's fantastic. And bottom-up coalitions like the America is All In initiative have support from subnational leaders that represent a constituency of more than half of the U.S. population. And since 2018, the total number of state-level mitigation activities has increased by 85%. And 169 more cities have introduced emissions reductions tar targets since then. I think that that is awesome, and it just shows that everybody is focused on actions to address issues that we are dealing with right now. As, as Allison said, it's not the future, it's the present, right? So summarize. So greenhouse gas emissions have declined, but we have a long, we have to go faster, right, and do more. Reaching net zero will involve improving our energy efficiency, reliance on, a uh, greater reliance on solar and energy, and we've seen the cost go down. We saw that in that great slide earlier, and reliance on emerging technologies. Large reductions in emissions could improve human health, which I think is very important, not just in air pollution, in terms of air pollution, but in other ways, too, that I won't get into. Um, that's a whole other uh, webinar. Um, <laughs> widespread electrification is another issue, and the bottom line is reductions in emissions could improve human health and reduce, excuse me, redress legacies of inequity, and that's important. And I, on my final slide is <laughs> these are all the authors who worked on the mitigation chapter. And no, you can't see them because they're too small, but it's outside on the table for you. And um, uh, all by our great leader, Stephen Davis. I have to mention you because I love him. He is very patient with, can you imagine this number of people, right, all ha who have ideas, their own ideas. And then here's where you can get the information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That is an impressive list of authors, uh, a ton of work, and um, uh, a really, really important document. Thank you very much for that. Um, our next panelist, you've heard her mentioned a couple times, Caitlin Simpson. Caitlin's actually not with us today in person. She's not feeling well. But she was nice enough uh, to take a few minutes out of her morning to actually record her presentation for us via Zoom. Uh, and so we'll still be hearing from Caitlin remotely, and we'll still be uh, seeing her slides which are also on the table and on the website. So um, Caitlin, if you're watching us online, uh, I hope you're feeling better. And um, we really miss not having you today, but we really appreciate that you were willing to um, help us with a presentation earlier today. So my colleague is going to put that up, and we'll all uh, enjoy Caitlin's presentation. Um, Caitlin is an, I forgot to introduce her. I was too busy explaining why she wasn't here. Sorry about that, Caitlin, assuming you're watching. Uh, Caitlin is an economist and program manager of the Climate Adaptation Partnerships Program within the Climate Program Office and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, Caitlin manages a network of 13 large research engagement teams focused on climate preparedness and adaptation issues across the country. She co-authored the adaptation chapter of the Fifth National Climate Assessment and has a wealth of experience assessing and communicating findings around adaptation research. She's been working for decades in the science policy sphere and as a federal funder of climate adaptation work is conducted in collaboration with state and local organizations and communities. So, Caitlin, thanks again for making your presentation available to us. I'm really looking forward to it. Take it away, Dano. Hello, I'm Caitlin Simpson, a program manager with NOAA's Climate Adaptation Partnerships Excellent. Program and the agency chapter lead for the adaptation chapter of the fifth national climate assessment. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about the chapter findings with you. Next slide. I thought I'd start with the adaptation definition that we use in this chapter. It is the process of adjusting to an actual or expected environmental change and its effects in a way that seeks to moderate harm or exploit beneficial opportunities. With this in mind, the overall findings of our chapter are the following. Adaptation activities are occurring across the US but have been small in scale, incremental in approach and lacking in sufficient investment. 
transformative approaches will be necessary to adequately address current and future risks, to improve capacity and promote an equitable future, adaptation activities must address the uneven distribution of climate harms and incorporate collaboration with local communities. Next slide, please. Our first main key message is that adaptation efforts are underway in every US region, but are insufficient in relation case of climate change. Although adaptation is occurring across the US, barriers remain. These barriers can mostly be overcome with financial, cultural, technological, legislative, or institutional changes. The figure on the right here illustrates the number of public and private sector adaptation strategies and activities publicly documented and or up since 2018. Since that time, city and state level adaptation plans and actions have increased by 32%. However, there is growing divergence in the ways government, private industry, and civil society are planning for climate adaptation, with each focusing on a subset of climate vulnerability, such as disaster resilience, risk and liability, and equity and justice, respectively and focusing on individual hazards, such as sea level rise, flooding, heat, instead of compounding and complex events. Next slide, please. Our second key message is that effective equity, effective adaptation requires centering equity. Effective adaptations must be just and equitable. For example, housing discrimination played a big role in putting people in hazardous areas. To adapt equitably, we have to ask questions like, who can afford flood insurance or elevate their home above flutters? Who can pay more for air conditioning during a heat wave? And who is working outside? The path from potential adaptation out options to outcomes is filtered through culture and decision-making criteria, processes, and resources. Individual traits, circumstances, and preferences mean that adaptation outcomes are not identical for all members of a community. These social factors may create, perpetuate, or exacerbate existing social inequities in a systemic fashion, such that even passive actions can produce inequitable outcomes. Intentionally integrating equity into adaptation can lead to more inclusive and sustainable outcomes. Next slide, please. Third, transformative adaptation will be needed to adequately address climate-related risks. It involves persistent, novel, and significant changes to institutions, behaviors, values, and or technology in anticipation of climate change and its impacts. Current adaptation practices in the US are predominantly incremental and do not clearly add up to system-wide transformation, which is needed to keep pace with extreme weather and climate impacts. For example, expanding access to cooling centers and air conditioning during a heat wave is an important incremental adaptation action, meaning small changes in business as usual. However, we also need ways to build and design infrastructure differently or deploy city scale district cooling systems so that indoor air temperatures don't reach dangerous levels, meaning more transformational change is needed. The diagram here illustrates various approaches. In some cases, incremental changes may add up to a transformation of the overall system. In other cases, they may not, or they may cause maladaptation. Transformative adaptation can also take different forms, including a series of small scale transformations or one-time large shifts. Panel B illustrates these conceptual approaches to incremental and transformative change. Each could be equitable if it follows the principles of equitable adaptation. Next slide, please. Fourth, effective adaptation governance empowers multiple voices to navigate competing goals. Numerous government, private, and civil society organizations support adaptation through funding, guidance, and other activities. However, adaptation governance has tended to occur in a bottom-up fashion with minimal coordination. Activities implemented in a coordinated fashion and with technical assistance, funding, and monitoring across sectors and scales have the potential to be more effective and transformative. Next slide, please. Fifth, adaptation requires more than scientific information and understanding. Climate services are needed for effective adaptation. 
However, they need to be coupled with intentional collaboration with communities. There are several federal programs that provide effective decision support for climate adaptation with this intentional community collaboration. NOAA's Climate Adaptation Partnerships Program, USDA's Climate Hubs, USGS's Climate Adaptation Science Centers, and others at EPA and DOE all provide climate services in a collaborative manner for a range of sectors and regions. As depicted in the table at the right, climate services can be designed to avoid engagement fatigue and advance transformative adaptation. They can also be improved by ensuring broad access for historically disinvested communities. Next slide, please. The sixth key message of the chapter is that adaptation investments and financing are difficult to track and may be inadequate. More and different funding is needed for adaptation. We are confident that investing in adaptation now will reduce the cost later. However, we need better financial and evaluation data to determine what adaptation is occurring, how well it is distributed, and the effectiveness of the adaptation solutions. In some sectors, proactive adaptation can help reduce projected damages from climate change. For instance, as shown in the graphic on the right, cost estimates are shown for two sectors, roads and rail, for 2050 and for 2090, under two different emissions paths and for three different adaptation scenarios, which reflect whether there is no adaptation, reactive adaptation, or proactive adaptation. The costs are significantly higher for the no adaptation scenarios and lowest for the proactive adaptation scenarios. Next slide, please. Finally, I would like to take just a moment to show the roles that NOAA has had in the assessment. As you can see in this slide, contributions are significant in terms of authorship, leadership, production, resources, and administrative support. NCA5 provides updates on our state of knowledge for a range of key NOAA science mission areas, including levels of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, temperature, precipitation, sea level rise trends, the changing nature of extreme events, effects on hurricanes, and effects on fisheries. NOAA's work on regionally based climate resiliency and adaptation, community engagement, and environmental justice is also reflected in the chapter contributions, including leadership roles in the newer chapters such as the social systems and justice chapter. In addition to federal employees roles in the NCA, NOAA funded university researchers were authors on many of the chapters. NCA 5 is a climate service for the nation. We can use it to further inform decisions to protect lives and property in a changing climate and take actions to reduce further impacts. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak about the findings of the adaptation chapter. You can, of course, find more information in the, in the chapter itself on the NCA website shown here. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin, for uh, sharing your presentation with us today. Um, and I hope, like I said, you're feeling a little bit better this afternoon. Um, we will now uh, turn to our fifth panelist of the day. Um, and uh, learn a little bit more about the uh, regional focus of the NCA5, which is very, very cool. Louis Rivers works to further the integration of social science at the Environmental Protection Agency. His research projects explore cumulative climate impacts and coastal resilience. Before joining EPA, he served as an assistant professor at North Carolina State University's Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources and at Michigan, State's University, or Michigan State University's Environmental Science and Policy Program. Louis was a co-author of the Southeast Regional Chapter of the Fifth National Climate Assessment. Welcome to the briefing today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. All right, I will try to stay on time because y'all have been listening to a lot of people talk for a minute. All right, um, thank y'all for inviting me to, to talk briefly. And um, when I think about the report, I really think about my kids. Also, people love pictures of kids, especially kids in costumes and kids that are incredibly filthy and kids who are hiking. I have all of it in one picture. But um, these are my two kids, August and Louie. I promise you, Louie's not named after me. It's a family name. I'm not that arrogant. Um, but in 2100, my kids will be in their 80s, which is like a mind-blowing thing. So a lot of the things that we're talking about in this report are kind of like future for us and like 
a lot of us won't be around to see it, but for my kids, this is going to be their reality in the world that they grow up in. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Southeast chapter. And like everyone else, I'm going to kind of go through four takeaway points. We're very organized that way. Um, I thank Allison for that. She was amazing. And there's a lot of uniformity across the report. But um, before I get started, I want to read the first chapter in our, I want to read the first paragraph in our chapter. So I apologize for reading, but I think it's important to hear what we have in the actual report. Patterns of climate risk, social vulnerability, and climate adaptation in the Southeast echo centuries of human history. The region consists of highly diverse communities and landscapes, including one of the most biodiverse areas in the continental United States. The Southeast ecosystem, stewarded for generations by indigenous people, are now in a precarious state. Centuries of political and land use decisions have threatened the landscape and the people, with a few, with a few prospering at the expense of many. These decisions, shaped by a long history of systemic and structural racial discrimination and aggression, continue to have lasting harmful effects on the preparedness of the Southeast communities for mounting climate change threats. The institutions of slavery and intergenerational ownership of individuals as property, Jim Crow segregation, and housing discrimination have resulted in many black, indigenous, and people of color communities living in neighborhoods that are disproportionately exposed to environmental risk and with fewer resources to address them when compared to majority white communities. And I think that's important that we say that, and we're super clear about that. And when I talked about this as a professor, I would tell my students, I'm not doing this to blame you or to shame anyone. None of us are architects of these systems, but these systems hurt all of us. It's important that we talk about our past accurately, because if we want to come up with solutions that could keep us going forward and serve all communities, we need to be honest about how we got here. And part of that is our social history, especially in the Southeast United States. So considering that history and that background, let's go through our four takeaway points. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to put up a takeaway point, um, regional growth increases climate risk. And then I'm going to show one of these really dope figures. Like, we spent a lot of time working on these figures, and they're, they're really well done. I'm not a figures person. I love figures. So it's great to be in a room with people who understood figures and like see the magic happen. So in this first figure, we talk about population change in the Southeast. I, I was going to start the talk by saying I live in the best part of America, <laughs> the Southeast. And I live in the best town in America. But everyone thinks that about their town, or I hope you do. <laughs> But um, there's some data to back up my assertion. A lot of people are moving to the southeast. So between 2010 and 2020, we had a lot of in people come in to the southeast, a lot of migration. We're going to see that trend continue between 2020 and 2050. But it's also going to slightly intensify. But the other trend that's really important to think about is that our rural areas are losing population. And this is where a lot of our most vulnerable communities are in these rural areas. So what we're seeing is there's like a lot of people moving into the coastal and urban areas of the Southeast, stretching the capacity and resources of those parts of our communities. And then a lot of people leaving our rural areas where we already have vulnerable populations and we're living in the capacity of those areas to respond to climate change. Our second key message. Climate change worsens human health and widens health inequities. And I hope you see there's a theme here in what I'm talking about, and it connects very much to the previous speakers. So again, another figure. So on the left, you see life expectancy, which is kind of a um, broad way of thinking about people's public health or public, how effective our public health systems are. And then on the right, well, B, I should have picked up from the previous speaker, say A or B. Left or right doesn't really work. So in B, we see social vulnerability. So this is a measure of how vulnerable a community is to different factors. So this is, um, it measures poverty, um, substandard housing, access to transportation, access to health care, and other factors. So what you see here, if you look at the light green areas in A, those are places with a kind of low life expectancy. The Southeast has the lowest life expectancy of, all, of any of the regions discussed in the report. If you look in B, those dark red areas are places or communities with high social vulnerability. And you notice there's an overlap between that life expectancy and social vulnerability. So we're all, like we said in the introduction, we're already in a precarious state. 
our lands are and so of our people. So we already have people who are really living tough lives. Climate change is going to exacerbate their experiences. So again, it goes to this first and worse. They're going to experience climate change first, and it's going to be much worse for them, and the impacts are going to go on much longer. Our third key message is climate change disproportionately damages southeastern jobs, households, and economic security. And I should say that um, I'm just picking one figure from our chapter to illustrate these key take-home messages. I really do encourage you to get into the chapter. There's multiple figures, a lot of very easy-to-read text that talks about each one of these key messages. So here we have another great figure. I really like these kind of color figures. They, A, they look cool, like I can see putting them on my wall, but I'm a science nerd, so maybe my outlier there. But I, I just think they're very elegant. So counties where low-income households overlap with limited community capacity, showing light gray, highlight rural climate risk challenges. And again, I'm going to focus on the rural communities, because I think we don't think about rural America enough when we think about climate change, or when we think about environmental justice. There's a lot of environmental justice issues in rural America. So essentially what I want you to take away here is that let's look at those light gray areas. And if you can kind of remember back to our previous figures, there's an overlap in like these areas of concern across all these different figures. So in these light gray areas, these are places where you have incredibly low incomes. And more than likely, if you're a child born to a family with low income in one of these areas, there's a good chance that you're going to end up also having a low income and having the same issues that your parents face. So it's really this question of intergenerational inter poverty that we're seeing here, which is going to be interacting with climate change. So like, essentially, we're creating traps for people. Their parents were stuck in one situation, and there's a good chance that they're going to be stuck in the same situation. But the trap is getting worse because people who do have the capacity to move away from these rural areas are leaving, reducing the capacity of an overall community to respond to climate change. And um, let me take a step back, and we've been talking about capacity a lot, and I think we throw that term around all the time, but like, what does capacity mean in reality? Capacity is like if your town is hit by a hurricane and your school is damaged, your kids may miss a month of school as opposed to a play community like Chapel Hill there's no way you're going to miss a month of school in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. <laughs> but some communities, you will. If your road is damaged, you may have a damaged road much longer than other communities. There's a lot of places in the southeast United States that when they are impacted by a natural disaster, which will be increasingly more frequent during, under conditions of climate change, they don't have the abilities to back, bounce back, which is really detrimental to the younger people and older people in those communities, those vulnerable populations that we care a lot about. And finally, I'll go to our fourth key message. Agriculture faces growing threats, but innovations offer help. I won't be talking about the innovations, but I'll talk about one more figure. Um, the Southeast black farmers face disproportionate weather and climate risk. So then again here, if you look at the darkest parts of this map, we've, a lot of our black farmers have lost land over the last 150 years in the United States. But those who are left are in the Southeast United States, and they are in a very precarious position. These are the counties that experience the most drought. So they're already expecting, experiencing disproportionate risk from the climate, and this will just increase over climate change. So this is a very small, special population that's an incredible danger as we experience climate change. So to wrap things up, more cute pictures. Um, but I think we talk about the youth a lot, and these are pictures of my mom and my dad, who's Louis Jr., so my son's named after him, or my grandfather, um, and his brothers and sisters, my mom. And but you know, we talk about the youth a lot, but I think we should also think about the people who've been here and our responsibility to people who've worked very hard to give us the lives that we have, and what type of legacy do we want to leave for them? And what type of actions can we do to make sure that the last years of their life, they can see that we're doing things to make things better for their children and grandchildren? In conclusion, I want to thank um, our great authors team, and especially our coordinating author, Steve McMulty, and Jeremy Hoffman. Jeremy would have been here today. Jeremy's awesome, but he gave a talk this morning. So um, I just want to thank our author team, and thank you all for giving me a chance to talk to you.
Thank you, Louis. That was great. I'm going to pass your placard down so we can, as we get into the Q&A. Where was that last photo where there was like a rocket? Where, the last. That is the um, North Carolina that just absorbed um, light and spice from Houston. Okay. That was a school field trip from our whole Very nice. Yeah. Very cool. They feel like a whole thing school. <laughs> Sounds nice. Thank you. Uh, well, that was a fantastic presentation. Uh, and thanks to our other panelists. That leaves us plenty of time for questions and answers. I have a whole bunch teed up, as I always do. Uh, for folks in the audience, my colleague Allison uh, will bring around a microphone, and I'll keep an eye out for hands. And if you're in our online audience, there's still a chance to ask us questions if you send us an email at askask.esi.org. At but while people in the room are working up their courage, I'm going to start with a question. <laughs> Um, and that way, and, and this kind of gets back to the idea that we hit on a little bit before, which is the idea that this uh, is not a prescriptive report, but it is designed for policymakers and to, to, to bring them up to speed about where things stand. Um, we're in one of the House Congressional Office or House Office buildings. There's a congressional agenda underway. Uh, I'm curious, Rosina. Perhaps we'll start with you, and then we can walk through the rest of the panel. Um, how does what so how, how do the findings in NCA5 potentially relate to items that are either currently on the congressional agenda or sometime soon could be added to the congressional agenda? Things like IRA oversight, things like Farm Bill. I'm curious what you think, and then we'll, we'll hear from Allison, and we'll go down the line. Thanks very much. Uh, since I'm not in the federal government, it's easier for me to try to answer this one. Um, I think one thing we realized uh, long ago when I was in the federal government is that the Farm Bill has uh, great potential to advance conservation of all sorts through um, the Conservation Stewardship Program, through the Environmental Quality um, Program. And so I think the Farm Bill coming up, thinking about the needs of farmers, of communities, adaptation, preservation, the nature-based solutions, the national climate solution, the natural climate solutions that we were talking about, about before are really important. I think there have been fabulous influxes of money through the IRA and the IIJA. Um, however, if you look at the ecosystem side, much, much less. You know, you'll see hundreds mm -hmm. of millions maybe, but not tens of billions. So I think that's one area that's under attended to. Two, two bills, well, 41 bills, and I think this is actually an analysis that your team did, Dan. Um, there were 41 bills in the last Congress that do slices of adaptation needs, and so I'm coming back to saying I think adaptation really needs a, a lot more work and a lot more action. But there's not an overall one, and so that's why I, I was ending uh, my talk was saying, I think this idea of a national coordination on Adaptation and Resilience for Security Act is a really good idea. The White House has put out a resilience framework, which I think is kind of moving in that direction. But I think we heard from all the speakers, adaptation is not yet well coordinated. And so if we really need to learn, accelerate, do things fast, um, I think having a, a national strategy which this act would call for would be very important. I guess one, one last thing that I might say, I think the bipartisan bills, the Coastal Disaster Resilience Act, um, and the elements we saw in the National Defense Authorization Acts recently were really also very powerful pushes towards adaptation. So coming up, the Farm Bill, um, but I think we should be thinking about adaptation and mitigation really in just about any piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Allison, curious to hear your thoughts about sort of how this re uh, report, report relate, relates back to the congressional agenda. Yeah, I feel like uh, you covered a lot there, so I won't have too much more to add, and hopefully I'm not stealing from your answer, but um, the, the thing that comes to my mind is that need for rapid deployment. So, um, you know, having the funding is one thing, but actually getting the clean energy technologies implemented on a widespread and very rapid rate uh, is going to be the tough thing, I think. Um, maybe beyond the scope of this, the question per se, but uh, one of the things that's really useful about this report is that it includes a lot of case studies, uh, particularly in the regional yeah. chapters that are highlighting the actions that these communities are taking, uh, whether mitigation or adaptation. And I think it's a really important element because it, it helps to see what other communities are doing and helps, uh, helps one community be able to learn from what worked or what didn't work in another community. So I think as we are um, 
rapidly deploying and implementing all of these clean energy technologies. I hope we're also telling the stories of what has worked and what hasn't worked so that we can uh, very rapidly be learning um, as we go. Thanks. Um, Adrian? Thank you. You did still. <laughs> no, the, um, the, the, I agree totally with what, what was already said. I, I think that it can be helpful when we talk about prioritizing, or in this instance, maybe some reprioritizing. You know, when we look at activities, for example, that we're engaged in, that the, I guess that Congress is sort of putting forth on mitigation, for example. I don't know why I chose that. Maybe because that's the chapter I worked on. I don't know. But when it comes to, uh, you know, a common theme was uh, communities that are most affected or that are affected first and worst, you know, is, um, you know, I think that the NCA5 can help with focusing efforts and focusing um, attention in areas that have been lacking that. Thank you. Um, Louis, we'll close out this round of questions with you if you have anything you'd like to add. What's that? Fair enough. Um, I, are you responding to, to the beeps, to the buzzes? Yeah. OK, that's just the house clocks telling okay. people what to do. It wasn't you. I, you checked your phone. I felt a little bad. We should have warned you first. Um, all right, I'm going to scan the audience. And uh, we have a question, Allison, in the, um, I guess it's the third row here, right in the middle. Thank you so much. Oh. Hi. Uh, thank you, first of all. Um, I noticed that most of you were um, talking about prioritizing greenhouse gas emissions. But my question is, for districts that can't prioritize that issue, what would you suggest is the next priority? Thank you. We'll open this one up to everyone, if you have anything you'd like to jump in with. I would say it probably depends on the region. I think um, if, if you can't reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, your only two other options are adaptation or suffering. So uh, we don't want that suffering part. Uh, so I would say uh, the transformative adaptation actions that we're talking about. And I would personally also uh, make a push for focusing on health. Uh, it is a theme that came up in every single regional chapter. There is a key message on health in every chapter. Uh, and it is what, of course, people care about. That's what, why we have the pictures of the kids up there. You, you know, you care about people's health. And climate and health is so uh, intricately linked that I think that's a place that every district would be able to focus on. Thanks. Um, Adrian, please go ahead. So I'm from Alabama. And um, I really appreciated your presentation. And, and when you said people who can't and that where emissions can't, don't occur, or I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think I got the, the message there. Uh, you know, I immediately thought about where I'm mobile, you know, and, and some of it is, of course, because of that particular state administration or whatever it is, you know. And to me, um, when, when, I, when you said that, my first thought was, then you've got to engage in mitigation, which is the same, which you're still doing, because now I'm thinking of, for example, for, fossil fuel facilities or something in communities. And once you shut those down or, you know, um, increase the, or make the, the um, make the guidelines more stringent, then in reality, you are reducing greenhouse gas emissions. You're just doing it differently. So for me, the, uh, um, the process would be think about it differently. Like, you know, come, come at it from a different way. So, and I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Louis or Rosina, do you have any thoughts you'd like to share? Um, I, I, I agree with everything that was said already. I mean, one thing that might help is, you know, you, you don't need to talk about energy, but you certainly want to improve kind of the livability of a community. And when you start thinking about that, that can mean making it more, you know, walkable. And then that can lead to health improvements too, or increasing green spaces, which can help with urban heat island effect. And then I think all communities are and need to um, think about reducing their vulnerability to extreme events, the floods and droughts. And so money will come from FEMA to states and to communities that have plans for how to deal with these extreme events. And so I think that extreme events and uh, livability of communities are two angles that might end up getting the mitigation without starting with mitigation, but they certainly will also help with adaptation and resilience. It's hard, Louis. I think it was your presentation. You talked about capacity, 
right? And what that looks like, it's hard to do in some places, right, that don't have the capacity to apply for FEMA or something like that. That's something that's an, an enormous challenge for a lot of communities. And um, using Louis' presentation as an example, I think a lot of those where you were pointing out that overlap, I expect that there's also a lot of severe capacity constraints that would also overlap with that. Yeah, and just briefly, you, you probably, you, you want to think ahead. So, like, you're going to need in these, like, you're going to need grant writers. So, a lot of rural communities, we say we're going to put out these funds for them, but they came and have the people, they don't have the staff to actually write the grants to access, the, access those funds. So, thinking about preparing communities before something happens is really important. And just to focus on the most vulnerable communities, because they will be hurt by any type of you know, disaster that happens. Thanks. Thanks for your question. Um, Allison, we have a question over here against the wall in the second row. Thanks. Hi. Uh, so I work for a congressman who represents a district in the South. Um, I'm wondering, you know, I heard a quote, or a fact quoted that, you know, 92% of people support, um, you know, natural solutions. Uh, but I also know that you know, a lot of times it comes, you know, considerations for the environment uh, tend to be polarized along, you know, like the economy versus the environment. Um, and so I'm wondering what um, you all would say makes for good bipartisan solutions to climate problems that can avoid the kind of classic clash of people wanting to, you know, people needing to use their car to get to work. Um, and not being a, and in a place where there's not, you know, necessarily infrastructure to have an electric car, right? Versus, you know, the natural want for people to participate in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Like, what? How do you avoid that dynamic um, in policy? Thanks. Um, please, uh, panelists, feel free to chime in if you have anything you'd like to share. Oh, I. But I'm. I'm. I'm I was going to say I'm not paid to be here, but actually I am. You aren't. Um, but I'll let you go anyway. Um, so, uh, we're here to hear from you. Well, I'll have to at least, again, stealing from Adrian's chapter, uh, point out that um, the report notes just how uh, expensive climate change is and how actions to reduce our emissions and ad adapt to climate change far, 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 far cheaper than experiencing climate change. So taking action will save us a lot of money. So I, I had to start from that baseline. And, and then I was really glad that Rosina brought up the nature-based solutions in, in response to the last question as well, because I feel like if Caitlin were here, um, she would have been talking about those um, win-wins that come from that kind of adaptation. Uh, and the, our ecosystems chapter talks a lot about that too. So um, thinking about how you're creating um, parks or green space and all of the different uh, win-wins that come from that. So you might be creating um, a recreational place that uh, improves health and mental health. You're creating a, a social space for communities to come together. You might be uh, improving your water quality if you're designing the park correctly. Um, you might be buffering against extreme weather events like flooding. Um, you, you are also uh, pulling greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere uh, as a carbon sink. So those sorts of solutions that just um, make sense across a huge swath of different sectors are also the ones that are really definitely um, economically viable. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Rosina, please. Um, but to your point, I think, um, and building on what Allison said, you, you know, the way our economic systems currently account for things, the, the cost of the damages are very hard to add up. The cost of the clean energy infrastructure is, is very easy to add up. And so I think one of the things that's really important and valuable is that every federal agency has been told to figure out ways to value what I guess we would call the ecosystem services, the, the clean water, the clean air, the co-benefits that you can get from a park or from cleaning up air pollution. And so, you know, you're right that there are all these um, embedded subsidies and things that we can add up and not account it for benefits in, in some of the benefits you can get from, from reducing greenhouse gases and improving adaptive capacity. So I think that field of economics is getting better, 
but it's it's been really hard to add those up, <laughs> the benefits. Yep. Um, if you find us, either me or my colleague Molly or my colleague Nicole, after the briefing, we can make sure you get a copy of that poll. We actually just published an article about it. And we have a couple other resources, too, that you might find useful if you'd like to catch up with us after the briefing. Uh, I think we have time. Oh, I see two hands, and they went up at the same time. Allison, there's... Um, uh, right in front of you, uh, we have a question, and then we'll end with you. We'll go a couple minutes over, um, but I think it's only fair to give you a chance to ask a question. Hi, everyone. My name is Alora. I work for the National Wildlife Federation. I admittedly have not had the chance to dive into the report, as I should, but I'm just curious. Um, are you all, <laughs> is this report address the issue of waste, or is that something you're thinking about? I know we talk about renewable energy, especially with batteries and things, but we know to make that, it has to be mined in Africa unfairly, and it causes more waste in other places. So I'm wondering, as we transition towards a clean economy or just transition, what are we going to do with the things people don't want and don't work anymore, and how do we make sure those things don't end up in black and brown communities for them to deal with now as you transition to clean energy somewhere else. Thank you. Hey, I will try my best to take that one. Yeah, um, and, and again, I think if Caitlin were here, she would uh, talk about a term we use in the report called maladaptation, um, which is where you, you might be trying to fix one problem, but you're you know swallowing the spider to catch the fly or something like that. Um, we, we talk a little bit about waste. I wouldn't say we go into a, a lot of depth there, but we talk about the different ways that both mitigation and adaptation could result in um, consequences that we don't want, um, and particularly the, the capacity to exacerbate or create new social injustices. Uh, so the report uh, goes into those sorts of trade-offs and things that we need to consider when we're developing these policies so that we're not exacerbating or, or creating new inequities. And I think, um, uh, particularly in the mitigation and adaptation chapters, there's a lot of um, examples where bringing the community into the conversation is really key to figuring that out, to figuring out how we don't create more waste that goes into black and brown communities. And so making sure that those people have a voice at the table from the, from the beginning is the way that we avoid maladaptation. Thanks. Adrian, please go ahead. I, ca I can't even add anything to that because that, Sorry. You know, when you said, no, no, I mean, I agree with you totally. Bring, having the right, having everybody at the table is the way to address all of that. And I always, I mean, that is, I'm so happy you said that. That is like the, that is the truth. You, you know? said it. I'm just quoting. <laughs> I just think, you know, I mean, it, when we, the chapter talks about food waste, for example, and, yeah. and a lot, but the only way to address the issue and to make sure that it doesn't happen, well, the, not the only way, but the main way is to make sure that the, all voices are heard, right? All the stakeholders and everybody who has some, uh, as they say in, in Mobile, a dog in this fight, because, you know, we're greyhound, greyhound racing, um, you know, has the voice at the table and provides input is the only way that fair decisions, equitable decisions are going to be made. So when you said that, I, that really struck a nerve for me. So I don't know if that gets at what you're saying, because when I talk to my students, they still say, oh, you know, we used to ship things to China and, and things, but they no longer accept it. And I'm like, and they shouldn't. We need to figure out, and that's just me, so <laughs> they need to figure, we need to figure out a way to deal with all our own issues, you know? And, um, and the same for other countries. Because things that are bad here are probably bad there too, you know? If we, like if it's a pesticide, we need to get rid of it here because we don't use them anymore. Sending them away to another country is not necessarily a good thing because it's bad over there too. So I totally agree with you. I almost want to hug you. Thank That's you. So good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we will go to you for our last question of the day. Thanks for being patient. I'm from the House Agriculture Committee and Majority Staff, and I wanted to ask because, uh, Dr. Hollis, I, I know you mentioned issues with agriculture and, and pollution and climate change, and I wanted to ask for some more detail on that, uh, specifically from you, but from the others as well, and how you'd like to see agriculture change to, to uh, meet the demand for uh, a better climate. Thank you. Well, I can talk about that in two ways. Thank you very much for the question. Um, the, the mitigation chapter talks about it in terms of um, the way we plant crops and the way we use the land and how much of the land we use and whether we're using it in a, 
in a, I don't know, the best way, an optimal way, right? That's a, that's a big issue. Now, the, the other agriculture that is probably talked more in detail in another chapter, so I would suggest reading the entire report, talks about things like confined feeding operations and how that pollutes the, the, uh, the environment, the water and the, and the soil, and, and, and creates, I'm not sure that it mentions, creates um, a form of air pollution, right, because people can't breathe. Um, in the neighborhoods, I'm thinking specifically of um, South Carolina because I work with some of the communities there. Um, so it's, it, it's not just agriculture in terms of um, using the land. Well, I guess it is. It's just I think of it in two different ways, using the land in a reasonable manner, but also when we talk about placement of farmland or, or animal, animal feeding operations, Maybe putting them close to the, to uh, water sources isn't the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. So things like that are, um, you know, just some of the general land uses, and I'm sure that there are other others that because you caught me off guard, I don't have right now. <laughs> Thanks, um, Rosina. Um, yeah, to, to build on that, I mean, there's also, uh, you know, re-emerging re uh, regenerative agriculture. There's thoughts uh, increasing about no-till, about multi-cropping. You know, mm -hmm. there's uh, interesting new attention to agrivoltaics, which is having crop lands that can also have solar panels. So you can do both energy and shade crops in case it's getting too hot and grow your crops. So I think um, thinking across the fields of mitigation and adaptation hasn't happened that much, but there is some potential there for you know, mutually reinforcing things. And then, you know, again, um, the conservation programs of the Farm Bill, if you look at the history of that over time, have increasingly added additional items. Like we, we really don't just want you to know, put it aside. We want to think about water. We want to think about biodiversity. And that, those have a lot of money in it. And I think those could be very powerful incentives if, if structured to push things forward on both mitigation and adaptation in the ag sector. We have a bunch more on that too. And we did a whole briefing series that a lot of those topics were covered. And Molly and Nicole and I'd be happy to talk with you a little bit uh, after the briefing if you have a spare minute. But I didn't want to cut you off, Louie. I saw you just out of the corner of my eye. Yeah, um, there's also a lot of social capital and strong social networks amongst American farmers. I'm thinking specifically about the extension services. So we have a strong extension service that supports a lot of farmers. And that's another opportunity for us to talk about climate change and think about redundancy in communities and mitigation and adaptation. My dad, he was in the Army. His second career, he was an extension agent in the Black Extension Service. So like we had the traditional extension service, which was, you know, has issues. And we had the 1890 Extension Service, which was largely served black mm -hmm. farmers. And the extension agents are really trusted in communities. So like, of course, you go to them from farming, but also like applying to my kids' college, you know, other things. So I think that's another opportunity for us to talk to communities about climate change through already trusted sources. Great. Thanks. Thanks for the question. All right. Well, we're a couple minutes over, and I think that means we probably have to wrap up. Um, I'm going to pop this slide back up. This is the survey link. If you are in our online audience or in-person audience, you can use this link to take a survey. Let us know how things went today. If you have ideas for future topics, like I said before, we actually read every response, and we, we, we do our best to um, find ways to improve. Um, huge, huge thanks to a tremendous panelist, uh, panel today, Rosina, Alice, and Adrian, and Louis, and Caitlin. Thank you for um, taking time today while you're not feeling well to record your presentation. I think they all deserve an extra round of applause, and, and Caitlin as well. Thank you so much. Um, we also wouldn't be in this room today if not for Representative Tonko and the Sustainable and, uh, Energy and Environmental Coalition, so thanks to him and his great staff. We were joined earlier uh, via video remarks by Representative Peters, so thanks you, Representative Peters, for being with us today and for your staff, who's always uh, a real delight to work with. Um, I'm joined by a bunch of my ESI colleagues today, uh, Dan O, who was helping us with the videos, Omri, Allison, uh, Aaron, Anna, Molly, and Nicole, and Tim which Tim doesn't always come to our briefings, but he pitched in today because this briefing is actually happening so early we don't have interns yet. <laughs> so all hands on deck. And Jeff is here as well, one of our fellows, the author of our Sustainable Aviation Fuel Fact Sheet, or Issue Brief, excuse me. Uh, tremendous resource if you want to learn a little bit more about that topic. And I have to say thanks to Scott for helping us uh, with all of the webcast and all the technology today. Um, we're going to wrap up. 
We will be back on February 1st for our next briefing about DOE's Earth Shots. Um, that is going to be incredible, and it should nicely complement um, the briefing today because we're going to be talking about big things that we need to be doing at scale, at pace, um, to reduce emissions and also deliver additional multiple benefits. Uh, and there's some really, really exciting stuff happening at DOE. So with that, thank you so much to our panel. Thank you for joining us today in person in our online audience. And we'll see you back in a couple weeks. And I hope everyone stays warm uh, and enjoys this little taste of winter that we seem to be getting this week. Thank you so much. Thank you.